trust in business in general has been declining for a long time. It has picked up since the financial crisis and it is at a higher level compared to trust in government. So those are the good news. But these are really high, really low levels of trust that people exhibit towards, towards business. What do you think board members, business leaders could do to reestablish that trust in business as an institution? Because it is the social fabric of society in a capitalist system. Yeah. Well, I think you have to start by looking within the company that you're responsible for and, and what is really happening in that company. As you walk the front line of a company, are the associates saying the same thing the executives are saying? Do they actually believe in the values and the culture? Are they being executed at the highest levels or not? And if they're not, it's hard to change and it takes time. It takes decades to change culture. It takes you know, years to change per financial performance, but it takes decades to change uh, real culture. And, and the really strong, valuable companies are the ones who have had uh, you know, years and years of consistent performance against a set of balanced perspectives and that they hold their, their executives accountable to that. I think for the directors to be involved in listening to what's happening in this process, it's, it's oftentimes an indicator, an early indicator about the kinds of issues that are on the horizon. So how do you think about these proxy submissions and, uh, and what actions do you take to try to not only answer that particular question, but understand what is it that's really being communicated in those, uh, in those interchanges. And, you know, in most every company, and I certainly would suggest that this is the right way to go, management's responsible for that interaction, but the board needs to listen very closely as to what's going on both ways in that, uh, and get an early indication so that you have some time to, to responsibly think about what, where should we be going on these issues? Maybe not this year, but in the future as we think about trying to lay this out. Because quick reactions to these types of issues usually give bad results. Right. Thoughtful um, you know, reactions over time uh, is where the, the, the value comes in. One of the things that I really think is important about a board is, and, and I, I believe most external people not involved in board matters don't really understand this, but the true value of a board is the collective wisdom of well-informed, committed people acting together, not an individual. And, and so having a board that has the time, has the information to think through the collective answers to these types of questions is where the biggest value to the corporation is. And I think in the last decade with all of the regulations and all of the criticisms of companies and boards, w many of us have stepped away from understanding what, what is really the function of a board and how should it act. And, and I think that's really an important um, aspect because we, we could easily dismantle a great system if we're not careful. And what I mean by that is the, this whole idea that investors want to talk to board members and, and, and board members should be involved in the, in, in the active management. That, that's not the role of the board, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And if you once make a mistake of, of breaking that sort of cone of commitment to the collective wisdom, um, you've lost an awful lot. Uh, from, from that, uh, that dynamic. If you're investing in the company, uh, your governance role as an investor is integral to that, and so people have been integrating, it's, and, and so it's continuing to unfold. We've gone through some period where things have been highly polarized, uh, where it's sort of investors uh, versus management, uh, with the board some, somewhere up there. I think that was never really the right, right way to construct it. It was, from the investor standpoint, at least forward-looking investors, um, have always supported a board-centric model, but they want to be able to hold directors and board members accountable, and that, that's what it comes down to. But they, they realize that the board um, is in the position uh, to, to be able to 
actually do the, the core governance uh, you know, from a very engaged perspective. Um, and, and investors are always going to be at a distance. So anyway, I think we've had an unfolding, and we're just getting more real over time. And a piece of that is people now actually feeling, feeling free to talk to each other, which is a good thing. The social issues that you uh, mentioned are, I think, of great concern. Um, my consideration is that boards were a creation of society. Somewhere along the lines, probably uh, way back in the antitrust days, uh, we came up with uh, the idea that we were going to have boards and they were going to look like this, and we got here over a period of time. And clearly, well, well there has been uh, some, um, some change, in mainly the 40s. Uh, it has been a, a shareholder supremacy model. But what I think we have today is we have uh, an awful lot of people who are unhappy with uh, where they are in society. We have um, unemployment, underemployment, a lot of underemployment. I'm sure you've all noticed, uh, it's never happened before, where we, we're getting more employment, supposedly, assuming the statistic is right, we're getting more employment, but no wage pressure. Uh, wages are still uh, bleak. So I think what happens is that uh, there are, there is a growing uh, number of people, just take a look at the recent election, you can see that. Mm -hmm. There's a growing number of people who uh, believe that they've been left behind by corporations and that corporations have a role and there's a million different definitions of what that role is. And I suspect that if we don't start to figure out how to get past the systemic issues with jobs, uh, that, is, that pressure is going to continue. So there is a school of thought that says that you need to be further along so you, I guess, essentially don't have a full-time daytime job. You would have enough time in order to do uh, this particular job. So that's one thing I would point to. Another thing I would point to is that every year uh, the NACD puts about 20,000 directors through some educational venue, whether it be uh, one of our advisory meetings or Global Board Leader Summit, one of the chapter meetings, 20,000. Well, okay, but where's everybody else? So that we still have, unfortunately, a whole bunch of folks uh, who are subject to uh, asymmetric information risk. The only education they're getting is uh, the education that they get from their own companies. They're evidently not attending sections such as this, so they don't have a chance to see other peers and to really test what their thinking is. So I think there is two sides to this, and I think I would lay it right down to the feet of the governance committee to say what kind of education you're getting, how far are you getting out there, what do we need in three or four years, what's that person look like, and one of the things we have to get rid of is this uh, conception, and we see it all the time, uh, no, I only want a board member who's been a board member somewhere else. Well, you got to start somewhere, right? It's pretty basic. It's always been basic to me. You got to get, as I said, the CEO right. You got to get the strategy right. And the, and the investors own the company. So we've, I've always believed you go talk to the people who own the company. They happen to be my boss. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I asked uh, one board I was on and, and they said, well, we're not going to talk to those people. I said, well, they're your boss. And I guess as you were coming up through the ranks, you just told your boss you weren't going to talk to him. None of that makes any sense to me because the reason this has gotten so messy is because boards have ignored investors, yeah. number one. Number two, they've done a terrible job because investors, you wouldn't have an activist investor if you were getting, if you're getting the return on capital you need, the return on, and, and you had a plan and they knew what it was, you wouldn't have all this stuff. I don't work for the stakeholders. I work for the shareholders. I work for capital. It's fine that everybody else in the company is worried about all that. If I'm responsible to the shareholders for them to get a return on capital, and if one of the things that muddied up the crisis is a lot of boards didn't do what they were supposed to do, i.e. fire the CEO the first minute, because they were worried about all this confluence of foolishness. Just know who you're working for. No matter what job you got, you better know who you're working for, and that's who you better work for. Don't get confused on what your job is. That stakeholder stuff, that's a lot of foolishness in my mind. Yeah, but that's the CEO's job and the people in management's job to take care of the communities.
this, this uh, need for the board to be incredibly focused on strategy has changed the way we select directors, it's changed the way we conduct meetings in the boardroom, and the way directors are demanding that meetings change. Um, it's changed the way we form that collaborative uh, wisdom that uh, leads the company forward, and it's changed the way uh, directors prepare themselves, self-analyze their performance, and, and the way we move on as we, as we do refresh directors over time. It's changed everything, really. Um, and it's, it's, um, we're looking for a different kind of person, uh, a person who um, uh, comes to this collective wisdom, uh, kind of like people do open source computing, uh, people who are collaborative, uh, and collaborative in a way that they really appreciate what other people are bringing to the table, that they're able to improve on that, that everybody sort of builds on the next person's contribution and that you get to a, uh, a conclusion that is uh, best for everyone and that everyone adopts. Um, it's changed the way we uh, work in the boardroom. Uh, we've moved away from presentations of historical performance and long slideshows. Um, boards want to see, they want more time to strategize, more time to talk among themselves, more discussions with futurists and, and experts who come in who uh, can try to predict for us what the business and the home of the future will look like. And they want, um, they want to be working with the part of the management team that is intricate in strategy. Uh, it's a whole new dynamic in the boardroom. Do we develop the talent? Are we in search of the talent that we need out there three, five years? Um, if, we, if we took a clean slate approach every year, and looked at not necessarily, you know, were you a performing director and a good director, but are you what we need? I think that changes the dialogue a little bit. And, you know, Labe was talking this morning about the, the whole congeniality aspect of, you know, you don't want to rock the boat, you don't want to shift things up too much. Sometimes that can, can go in the opposite direction and, and you get stagnant. Um, because you don't want to rock the boat. So what if we looked at, again, that, that phrase fit for purpose, what if we looked at if, if we had the optimal board, would it contain the people that we currently have sitting around the table? How do we take that stigma away from moving somebody off of a board? Not that they're a bad director, they're just not what we need right now. They may be a great director on another company. Um, so you got to get beyond this kind of old school approach, the status quo in this age of speed of technology, speed of business transformation, disruption that we're facing, we're still putting directors on boards like we did 30, 40 years ago. And I think we've got to rethink that.